we're, we're looking at rightly dividing the Apostle Paul. Uh, go with me if you will. Today's, tonight's study is called Latter versus, excuse me, Early versus Latter Epistles. Look with me at chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read one verse and then we'll have a, a word of prayer. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 1, Paul writes, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time tonight. Thank you again, Father, for the freedom to worship you corporately with those of like precious faith and even the blessing of technology and having the resource, Brother Ryan, to get out uh, these studies for those who, who uh, uh, love you and love this ministry and, and use it as part of their uh, growth in Christ. We appreciate that we can be used of you to help other saints grow uh, in your holy word and in your son. Father, we thank you for, the again, the freedom that we can come in and do this. We take it for granted at times, but when we hear of other, uh, other people who don't have the same freedom we have, particularly in this country at this time, we thank you for that, and we ask your great mercy that we can continue to do this till you come. Heavenly Father, as we look into your holy word tonight, may you give us great insight, understanding, and wisdom, and most importantly, a greater appreciation of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. All right, the Bible. I, so I, 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 I make these studies just in case someone's seen me for the first time. Um, I've been teaching the word on video for over 20 years, even back to Chicago. But I always think maybe someone, and I, I know this because I get contact from people, someone's going to see our, our, this video, and this will be the first time they know of our ministry, NorCal Grace. So I like to teach in a way to benefit you saints who've been with us for a while, but also someone who's new, even someone who's lost, and give them an understanding of the word. The greatest compliment I've ever gotten and any preacher can get is you make the word understandable, make it plain and clear. And so what I want to say is the Bible is a book of progressive revelation. You must know that. When you look at, for example, the dietary laws of the Bible, God gave Adam certain dietary laws, right? He could eat anything, uh, fruits, vegetables, and those things. This was before uh, God allowed them to eat meat. He couldn't just eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Then you come to Noah. After Noah came off the ark in Genesis uh, chapter 9, God says, if you can catch it, you can eat it. You can have meat. He put, he put this division, this fear of the animals in man, uh, on man, and he now allowed them to eat meats. But when you come to the law of Moses, God separated those meats, clean meats versus unclean meats, ceremonial, ceremonial clean meats versus unclean. And that was to show Israel that they were a separated nation. But then you come to Romans chapter 14, Paul says everything is, is, is okay to eat. You can eat the meat. He says it in 1 Corinthians, he says it in Timothy. He says, don't allow them to have you abstain from eating meats and so forth. So as you progress through the Bible, if you stop reading back in Genesis, you wouldn't know that you could eat meats until, excuse me, you didn't know, you wouldn't know that, you, that they separated the meats with Moses until Exodus. So I'm saying when it comes to the Bible, you have to progressively read it, okay? You must have that context in mind when you study the Bible. What makes a preacher a good teacher is he knows the entire scriptures rightly divided. But I'm going to show you something that is not even focused on even in dispensationalism. Many of our brothers talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, and that's the Bible. Uh, they, they, they can break down the Bible, prophecy versus mystery. What is prophecy? That which is spoken out of the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began, Acts 3, 19 through 21. What is the mystery? Paul's epistles, which are the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. You can divide earthly things from heavenly places. Israel was created for the earth, the body of Christ for the heavens. There's an earthly kingdom and a heavenly kingdom. The first verse of your Bible is, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. You can divide, again, the Hebrew people, Abraham's seed from the Gentiles, the circumcision from the uncircumcision, and ultimately law versus grace. God dealt with Israel under the law, he now deals with us under grace. Now, most dispensational churches make those distinctions. But what I've seen a lack of amongst dispensational brethren is rightly dividing the Apostle Paul. Because it's, it's one thing to know that Paul's 13 books, so he, he has 13 books. It's one thing to know that his 13 books are for us, but even amongst Paul's 13 books, 
written over the course of 20 plus years, you have to rightly divide the early epistles from the latter epistles. Now I'm gonna put the early epistles here and the latter epistles over here. The early epistles are Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, here in our text, 2 Corinthians, and Romans, okay? Then his latter epistles, and I'll explain what's, what, what, what incorporates uh, early versus latter. Then you have, so this is six of them here. Six is, by the way, the number of man, okay? You got seven over here. You have Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, first, yeah, first, yeah, you got, the, you got that order. You know, I'm, I'm going to check that out too, Dodie. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm just going in, in this order. Um, they all written about the same time. First Timothy, Second Timothy. Uh, yeah. I got Philippians right there. No problem. Titus. Yeah, it's not in the same order. Philemon. By the way, can I see that, Dodie? Dodie has printed out uh, these things about the Apostle Paul. I think this is the best one in my, in my years of not only his books, but the order they were written. Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, early. Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon, Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 2 Timothy is obviously the last one, so those seven. And seven is the number of spiritual maturity, spiritual perfection, okay? So these right here have to do with spiritual, these seven spiritual perfection, that the man of God may be perfect. Now, what, what makes a book a early epistle versus a latter epistle? Well, what signifies the early epistles is the mystery wasn't the revelation of the mystery was not complete. Was not yet complete. Okay? So when you're reading... These epistles, Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, the revelation of mystery was not, was not yet complete. When it comes to these right here, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all them, the revelation of mystery, the mystery is complete, okay, is now complete. And because of that, some things change. Also, these were written... Or the focus of the early epistles was the transition, the transition period of the book of Acts, the transition period of the book of Acts. That's the focus of those. There's some temporary things going on, temporary, okay? So, so you, these are things that you need to look for when you're reading those epistles because a lot of confusion happens in Christendom, even amongst dispensationalists, because they're reading some of Paul's early epistles and they're not rightly dividing it from his latter epistles because things change. There's things that he writes and does in these epistles during the early transition period of Acts that he doesn't say or do in the latter epistles, okay? The focus over here has to do with transition, transition in its infancy of the body of Christ. Exactly, transition. Here it's complete. Let, let me show you in our, in our text. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Here's 2 Corinthians. Oh, by the way, can I see that again? I might as well just keep it. <laughs> Listen. Here is a good one because they, they give the, 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 the dates or the, the, the dates that they believe. And this is pretty, this is pretty good one, you know. Um, let, me, let me say this. Paul's epistles were written around the time. I wrote something down. According to this, it says AD 49 was Galatians. AD 51, 1 Thessalonians. AD 51, 2 Thessalonians. AD 56, 1 Corinthians. AD 56, 2 Corinthians. Romans 57. Ephesians 60 to 61. Colossians the same. Philemon the same. Philippians 62. 
1 Timothy 62, 63, Titus 63, 80, 67. I did some research about this, and what I saw is that most believe that the earlier epistles were written from AD 49, so they're pretty close, AD, AD 48 through 61. So some as early as 48. In that range, 48, 49, that's what I think too. That would have been when the, uh, when the uh, kingdom probably would have been established had, had the dispensation of grace not come. Maybe I'll talk about that another time. And that the latter epistles between 61 and 67. Now, supposedly after the great fire of Rome in July of, of AD 64, these would have been the time that the, these epistles were written, okay? But also before the last year of Nero's reign. Nero's reign came to an end in 80, uh, AD 68. Paul died under Nero, so Paul would have died about that time, AD 67, okay? And that seems right to me because what something significant happened three years later, three to number completion. In, in 70 AD, Titus and the Romans destroyed the Jewish temple, okay? So right before that happened, three years before that happened, Paul, the last apostle, dies under despicable Nero. So Nero was at... Oh, it does. Yes, it does. So we have that. So I just want you to see, when it comes to rightly dividing Paul, you need... By the way, I did the mystery of iniquity last time because people were asking me about what was going on in Israel the Middle East and all that. But when it comes to Paul's epistles, I'd say this is the first thing you have to rightly divide. Later, we're going to talk about things like position versus practice. We usually call it justification versus sanctification, but that's a little more confusing. Position versus practice. Uh, a couple other things. Um, individual versus corporate. So there are verses that apply to us as individuals, and then there are verses that apply to the body of Christ corporately. That's mixed up too, you know that? Remember we were talking about the word dwell. The issue of the spirit dwelling is a corporate issue. So the body of Christ corporately, the spirit of God dwells in us, 1 Corinthians 3. But for the spirit of God to dwell in an individual believer, not just in, but dwell, that is a sanctification issue and that's something that you need to let, let him dwell in you, okay? So we, we'll talk more about that when we touch it. So today we're going to be looking at early epistles versus latter epistles. And I'm going to show you verses from these early epistles that show that they're early. We're going to see that some things change. And then we'll look at the latter epistles, okay? Let's look at that. Um, early epistles, let me go look at this. In these early epistles, the revelation of the mystery was not yet complete. Look at our text again, uh, chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. 2 Corinthians is an early epistle of Paul. It is not expedient or beneficial or necessary or profitable for me doubtless to glory. Paul had to defend his apostleship over and over with the Corinthians. Now I want you to focus on the second sentence there. I will come to what? Visions and revelations of who? The Lord. Go over to Acts 26. Go back a few books to Acts chapter 26. Why did, why did Paul have these visions and revelations of the Lord? The Lord was giving him doctrine. The Lord was giving him the revelation. of He was revealing the mystery to Paul, and then Paul would write it down. So in 2 Corinthians, which is way down here, the fifth book, Galatians, he hadn't had it. Second, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. And then finally, we're going to see some in Romans as well. It's not until those six books are written that then when Paul starts writing, he writes with the revelation of the mystery complete. I'm going to show you that starting with Ephesians, okay? Deeper. It's deeper, yes. Now we have it, and he's telling us to get it in us. But up, up until that point, these six epistles, he was still receiving revelation from the Lord. Let's look at that. Look at Acts chapter 26. Verse number 13, if you will. The, the, the Apostle Paul is recounting his road to Damascus salvation. 
since he's our pattern, when we want to talk about Paul's ministry, we should go back to the road to Damascus. In, in Acts 9, he's saved on the road to Damascus. Damascus, Syria, by the way. You know Damascus, Syria is in the news today, right? There's a lot going on in Syria. And Damascus is still the capital of that city. That's where our apostle was on his way. It's going to be demolished. Yes, it is in, 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 in the future. That's right. But it play, uh, Damascus, Syria plays a huge part in prophecy. Now, by the way, Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. He didn't get there. He did eventually, but he got saved before he got there. Exactly. He, he was a Gentile city. And he was going after the, those who were dispersed because of the persecution, right? But in Acts chapter 22, Paul gives his testimony as well. And here for a third time, three is the number of witness and spiritual completion. Notice what he says in verse 13, Acts 26, verse 13. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven. He's seeing the Lord, right? Now watch what he says. It's above the brightness of the sun. It's midday. The, the, the sun's at its brightest over the Middle East there. And he sees a light from heaven that's brighter than the noonday sun, right? He says, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journey with me. Verse 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue. By the way, each incident, Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26, you get more and more information. Now he says the Hebrew tongue. He didn't say that before. Check this out. Saul, Saul. And what happens when, when the Lord says your name twice? First coming, second coming. This is the truth for the Israel. Saul, uh, Saul represents Israel. First coming, second coming. And in his first coming, they persecuted him. And he's talking about at the time set up for his second coming, there's going to be persecution of his little flock. Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? He, he represents unbelieving Israel. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse 15. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecuted. One more thing about this. If you're using the NIV or another version over in Acts 9, when he says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? That's not in there. His confession of faith is not in that Bible. The confession of faith of the Ethiopian eunuch, Acts 8, in fact, in that Bible, Acts 8.37, it's not even in there. They just take the verse out. It goes from Acts 8.36 to Acts 8.38, right in there. Well, because they don't, because that's the verse that says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That, that those, they attack his deity, see, the confession. All right, verse 16. But rise and stand upon thy feet. Now, I want everybody to pay attention. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and what? And of those things in the which I will what? Appear unto thee. Saul being a man like us, he couldn't get it all at once. So the Lord Jesus Christ gave the mystery, the revelation of the mystery to him piecemeal over the course of 20 plus years. As he gets some information and the Spirit of God moves him, to write, he starts to write this information down. And I'm going to show you as we look at this, at this book that as, as these books, you're going to see in these books there's evidence that they're early epistles because you're going to see things that you can tell the revelation is not complete. They need the, the supernatural working of the, the, the spirit and so forth. So that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, Go with me. Let's let's start with uh, Galatians. Go with me to Galatians chapter number three. So let's look at some of this. Look at Galatians chapter three. If you look at Galatians, uh, I said three. Uh, let's start at verse one, chapter one. Um, at least I do this. I'm so familiar with Paul's epistles that as I'm reading them. I pick out all these little tiny details, and even one like this. Look at Galatians 1, verse 8. Galatians 1, verse 8. But though we, speaking of Paul and his companions, but notice this, or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Why would Paul have to tell the Galatians 
or an angel from heaven. Yes, we're still, though you said it, we're, this is the first book, we're still in that time of transition where the, the, the prophetic program and things like angelic appearances and so forth, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a holy angel, right? It could be one of the devil's angels. We're going to see in 2 Corinthians. But notice he says an angel from heaven. That's a phenomenon that's not, that's not very uh, um, popular in our time. No, but in that day, that was something that was popular as far as angelic appearances. If you read the book of Hebrews, uh, the last chapter, he says, the writer of Hebrews tells the Jews, he says, uh, don't forget to entertain strangers for some have entertained angels unawares, right? In prophecies, angels would appear, okay? So Paul wants to warn them and say, look here, if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we preached unto you, let them be accursed. So Paul warns them, okay? Go over to chapter 3. Here's another one that shows where this book fits in in his early epistles. Uh, yes, sir. You, um, you said it again in verse 9. Why do you think he said it twice? Well, anything where the Bible says it twice, if, if, he's, he's, if it's a warning or something like that, mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's emphasizing that the importance of that. Thank you. Let's read that. Go back to Galatians 1. Notice how he says this, Brother Craig. He says, as, as we said before, right, so say I now again. It's, it's, it's just, uh, that's an early epistle type of thing, too. It's a, it's a testimony of a witness out of the mouth of two witnesses, two or three witnesses. You see that, Craig? Yeah. So he, it's, it's basically he's bearing witness again. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you've received, let him be accursed. So Paul is just giving them an extra warning, an extra witness. He's showing the importance of don't go after another so-called gospel, right? Uh, go over to chapter 3. There's a dual duality in that accurse too, right? It means like be cut off from the assembly, Yeah. Be also in that state you're cut yeah. off from the reward too. You're cut off from the reward too, that's right. Obviously if it's a brother in the Lord and he comes preaching something opposite of Paul, you cut off, that's right, from the reward. Thank you, Ryan. Look at chapter 3. And verse number two, two, uh, yeah, Galatians three, verse two. This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Now, when you and I got saved, unless we knew what the word of God says or had somebody teach it, we wouldn't have known we received the spirit of God. It wouldn't have been this outward visual thing. But in the beginning, in the infancy, you could see it in the book of Acts. When Cornelius got saved, he's a Gentile, after the Apostle Paul was saved, the Spirit of God came, in, and they could see it. They could hear it. So Paul understands, notice this, received, uh, uh, verse number two, this only what I learned of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. They could recognize when we heard the gospel of grace, we received the Spirit. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Now, they were trying to keep the law and so forth. Self-righteous. Self-righteous, trying to keep the, the law exactly. This is the difference between law and grace. Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Now, look at verse 5. He, therefore, that ministered to you the spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Notice those supernatural spiritual gifts were in operation. This man was, th these men, the churches of Galatia, would minister the spirit and they would work miracles among them. Miracle working, miracles, working of miracles was a, it was a common thing in the early body of Christ. Before the was exactly, before the writing was complete. So even when Paul wrote Galatians, you could recognize that there were men in the assembly ministering the Spirit of God, and we'll talk about that when we get to 1 Corinthians, but also doing miracles, signs, and wonders and things, okay? That's not what the body of Christ is doing today. But in his early epistles, like Galatians, and the reason this is important, if you don't recognize that that's something that was done in the early infancy of the, the church, you could say, well, Paul says it, right. so that's for us but you got to rightly divide the Apostle Paul, okay? 
Um, let's look at some more of this. Um, that was Galatians. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Let's try 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 1 Thessalonians 2. And this will, this will help make this passage make more sense to you. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. And go down to verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of who? God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now what's important about this verse is this. When you go to Acts 17, where Paul first went to Thessalonica, the only book of Paul that was written by then would have been Galatians. And it wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been highly circulated probably at that time, especially at Thessalonica, depending on seeing where Galatia is, okay? So the point is, Paul's talking about something new. They couldn't go to the Old Testament to understand the mystery because it's not there. So because of who Paul was, and you can read the book, he, he, he lived a life that was so above reproach and his love for them was such that they could trust him. That's what this verse is saying. The Thessalonians, I want to say this, they didn't have testimony from scripture to, to, to rely on like we do. So let's look at it in that, in that verse 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you, now notice, when ye what? Receive the word of God, right? It, he's from Paul and his, and his ministers, Tim, Tim, uh, Timotheus and, and Silas at this time. Which ye heard of us. That would have been Timothy and Silas as well. Ye received it not as the word of men. Why, why could they have received it as the word of men? Because men were giving it to them. Paul couldn't say, open up your Bible to Galatians chapter 5. He didn't do that. He said, here is the word of the Lord. And they had to trust him, right? Notice, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of who? God. Paul, Sabanus, and Timothy were preaching the mystery to these people by the spirit of God. They had to take it by faith. They had to take it by faith. And also, Dodie, if you read this whole book, Paul is saying we're different than every other preacher you ever saw. We're not taking from you. We're giving. We're working with our own hands and that type of stuff. Paul is saying, you can trust me because I'm different than anybody else you've seen. But he's saying, that's what, that's what that verse is saying. The Spirit of God is speaking through us, and you guys are receiving it. Let me show you that. Look at chapter 5. Go over to chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19. This is a small verse, but notice what he says. Quench not the what? The spirit. What does it mean to quench something? Dousing. Yeah, to, 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 like, like you uh, dousing it with water, right? Um, you're putting it out, right? The spirit of God was operating supernaturally. Because look at the next verse. Despise not what? Prophesying. What does that mean? As the word of God is going forth by these prophets, it was done by the Spirit of God. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all people. Here's what I want you to see. During this transition period, the Spirit of God was operating in a way that was supernatural. They didn't have any book available but Galatians. Exactly. But part of that, Dodie, was they could see the actual operating of the spirit, right? And they had to believe it. I'm going to show you more about that when we look at, like, 1 Corinthians and so forth. Um, look at 2 Thessalonians. Go over to 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2. Let's look at chapter 2. It's so many of these. My, my problem was narrowing these things down. It's so many. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that's the rapture, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Now watch this. Neither by spirit, 
nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the, the day of Christ is at hand, and so forth. Now, that, it, that issue of neither by spirit. Remember, they were still at a time where there was supernatural working of spirits. Not just the Holy Spirit, but evil spirits as well. The satanic. Um, if you look at the book of Acts, everywhere Paul went amongst the Gentiles, he'd run into people who were devil-possessed, right? And they would say things, like the, the girl who had the devils, these guys are the servants of God, blah, blah, blah. And Paul had to cast out devils. That's what he was doing. And these devils could communicate. That's one of the things they do. These spirits communicate. And the point is, he says, don't be troubled. If you hear anything opposing what I'm telling you, notice verse 1, by our gathering together unto him. Paul is going to say, you guys are not going to go through the tribulation period. But others will say you will. Do you know to this day, people teach and believe and teach that we will go through the tribulation period, speaking of the body of Christ. Ryan and I were talking about something on uh, Sunday about uh, 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 certain positions about the mystery of iniquity. But some people see, see that mystery of iniquity in light of a, you know, a, a post-tribulation rapture and so forth. Well, no. Paul is saying in that passage, don't get troubled that you're going to go through these things because we're going to go before all of that. Okay? But my point is, this, these, these things were happening in the supernatural realm because the, in the infancy of the body of Christ during the transition, that was going on. So that, that's, that's the type of stuff you see early in his epistles. Um, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. So we did Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, if you will. Look at verse 13. 1 Corinthians 1, 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Now watch this part. Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul talked about water baptism there. When he went there in Cor to Corinth in Acts chapter 18, he did baptize people. Notice, water baptized. Verse number 14. I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. They were Jews. They were Jews. Lest any should say I had baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. Notice Paul's, his, his mentality is, I don't keep up with who I baptize. That's, the, that's not what, look at the next verse. For Christ sent me not to what? Part of the kingdom program, the earthly kingdom program, water baptism was not only a part, you had to do it for salvation. Peter tells those Jews in Acts 2, repent, verse 38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. In the name, in the name of Jesus Christ, they had, to, they had to confess his name, right? But it was for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Paul is saying, Christ didn't send me to baptize. That tells you he doesn't have the same gospel. He don't have the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of grace. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, that's the grace gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made a non-effect. Paul's preaching is the preaching of the cross. But the reason I'm showing you this is because he had to write that in the early epistle because baptism was still an issue then. I said I couldn't get to all the verses, but in Galatians, circumcision was an issue then. Now, circumcision is not much of an issue in our day, is it? I've never went to a circumcision church and they say, if you come in here, you must be circumcised. But can I tell you the equivalent of that is water baptism today. You got whole denominations called Baptists. They call us dry cleaners, by the way, dry cleaners. Because we don't, we don't teach water baptism. Because Paul says it's not water baptism. Colossians 2 says it's a spiritual baptism. But the point is, we don't have to worry about uh, uh, bat, uh, circumcision. So I didn't go to those verses. But in, in Paul's day, physical circumcision was an issue, whether you were not saved or not. Now, in, in, in our day, water baptism is. So Paul says, Christ sent me not to baptize. Let me give you another one. Look with me, if you will, at chapter 2, verse 12. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Why? That we might know the things that are what? Freely given to us of God. One of the reasons God gave the Holy Spirit originally is so that we could know, when I say we, if we were in that body of Christ back then, know the things that were freely given to us of God. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, right? But which, who, who teaches? The Holy Ghost teacheth, compares spiritual things with spiritual. The point is, the Holy Ghost ministry was active in teaching these things through men. It was supernatural. We're going to see later in this book. Um, before we get to chapter 12 and through 14, go, go to chapter 7. Let me show you another thing. Look at chapter 7. This is talking about husband and wife and so forth. I think every wedding I do, and I got one on the 23rd, that's Saturday. I, I put these verses. If I do, if somebody asks me to do it, I'll do it. I'll serve them. But you know what? They get the they get the word. I did marks, and they got the word. And even his uh, Baptist, even his uh, Baptist uh, in laws, very legalistic, especially the mother mother in law. They compliment me first of all because I use the King James Bible, and they like that. And they wasn't getting some little mushy cushy little message. They got the word of God. And these passages, I teach the husband and wife. In fact, we're going to sit down with the couple on Saturday. I'm going to go over these verses. I'm going to say, this is what we're going to get. Because notice here, we talked about husband and wife, verse number four. The wife hath not power over, of her own body but the husband. And likewise, also the husband hath not power of his own body but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time. So you have to get permission that ye give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency, the inability to control those desires. You see that issue of fasting and prayer. Paul never commands the body of Christ to fast. Yes, it was Jewish culture because where did the Corinthian church start? In a, from a synagogue, right? Acts chapter 18. In fact, didn't, didn't Sunday we saw that uh, Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue got beat up at the judgment seat. We were looking at the judgment seat. And next thing you know, Sosthenes is in this book, chapter 1, verse 1. He got saved. I think Paul healed him, and he got saved. The point is, those Jews, one of the things they did was part of their culture. Remember Paul says, amongst the Jews. Even those Jews who got saved into the body of Christ like Paul, they still fasted and prayed. That's how they learned how to pray to God, okay, especially. But also, but there's another issue with the fasting here too. Just, how do I say this? Just like you fast from food, it's a fasting from that type of, that relationship, that, that consummation of, of the marriage relationship. But I just want you to say, a lot of people ask me, says, Brother Ron, do we, are we commanded to fast? And they'll bring in this verse. And I'll say, see, you don't see any of other Paul's epistles commanding that. Now, another thing, in the Old Testament, Jews fasted to get God to move on their behalf, right? They would do what they call sackcloth and ashes and, 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 and declare a fast. You see that in the Middle East culture right now. But God is not commanding us today to do that. In any of his latter epistles, Paul doesn't command that in order to get the Father to move that you have to do that. We have a different relationship with God than the nation of Israel did. He dealt with them as children. He deals with us as sons. We have a, a status uh, of Grown, we're grown before the Lord. That's why he puts us under grace and not tutors and governors. But I just want you to see, you'll see these. Go ahead. Go ahead, daughter. Didn't the division of the preaching, Peter went on to the Jews at that point, and Paul went on to the Gentiles. And uh, second, Acts 15. Ephesians. Um, well, no, it's actually. I mean, the, the traditions of the Jews in the first books, mm -hmm. because Peter was still there, Up until, well, in Galatians? Galatians chapter 2, he looks back a few years, okay. about 14 years. And what happens in Galatians 2, he recounts what they call the Jerusalem Conference of Acts 15. Right. From Acts 9 to Acts 15, 
both the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of grace were being preached right. simultaneously to different groups. Mm -hmm. But that's transition. When they had the Jerusalem conference, right? Okay. Paul records, hey, that Peter would confine his ministry <clears throat> to the circumcision. Right. And then he would go out to the heathen, which would have been all the lost amongst the Roman em that's empire. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Peter went and continued with the Well, correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, but since you brought it up, that's why you know the word. Later in, 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 in Galatians 2, even though Peter at, at that past meeting yeah. says that we're going to just confine ourselves to the circumcision, right. you, you do find Peter living yes. amongst the Gentiles. Right. He learned what grace was. He realized he didn't have to keep all those ceremonial laws and so forth like that, even though I have no doubt Peter went back to the temple until, it was, until he died or destroyed. But then the Jews came in and he went with them. Right. Yeah, that was the point where he... Yeah. They came down and then he went, he was living after the manner of the Gentiles and then right. Paul got in his face about it. Right. So, cause, cause you know what? He didn't stand up for the truth of the gospel, which means there's no difference right. today. That's okay. Right. No difference. So first Corinthians, uh, another thing, go over to chapter number 13, uh, chapter 12. We'll, we'll look at 12 in 12, 13 and 14. You have what's going on with the supernatural working of the spiritual gifts and so forth. Look with, look with me if you will. <clears throat> Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Uh, Brother Rod asked me one day to do these ignorant statements. I would not have you ignorant. Six times Paul says this, or seven times says we're not ignorant of his devices in 2 Corinthians. Verse 2. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the what? Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. The spirit was actually speaking through men and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Verse four. Now, there are diversity of gifts, but the same spirit. There are and there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There's the spirit. There's the Lord Jesus. And then the father in verse six. And there are diversities of operation, but it's the same God. There's the Godhead which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. And then he goes into all of these things. Go, go down to verse number um, nine to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts. Look at that gifts of healing by the same spirit. Look at verse 10 to another, the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another diverse kinds of tongues. What are tongues in the Bible? <coughs> languages. They're the languages. Yeah. To another interpretation of tongues. What I want you to see is that during the writing of first Corinthians and, and by the way, I got to deal with this because Christendom today, they get in, They see this stuff and they say, oh, this is all working. They believe some believe that the proof of your salvation is you speaking in tongues. But wait a minute when it was in operation, go down, if you with me to verse number 29, first Corinthians 12, 29. For those who believe that the proof of your salvation is you speaking in tongues. They, they didn't, I guess they never read this or don't pay attention that even when it was in operation, notice this by the Holy Spirit, verse 29, are all apostles? The answer is no. Every person in the body of Christ wasn't an apostle. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Are all workers of miracles? No, there were certain men who worked miracles in that time. Verse 30, have all the gifts of healing? The answer is no. Look at the next part of verse 30. Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? Paul is asking these questions because he's saying not everyone did these things. So if, 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 the, if the proof of your salvation was you speaking in tongues, this verse puts a monkey wrench in that theory because even when it was an operation, not everybody could do it. So that's just some false stuff. Look at chapter 13. Look at chapter number 13. Verse 8. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall what? Fail. Now that doesn't mean if God gave somebody a prophecy that it wouldn't come to pass. It means one day the gift of prophecy will fail. It'll be done. It wasn't needed, it wasn't needed after a certain time. Right. Look at the rest of that verse. Verse 8. Charity never, never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall what? 
when you read Psalm, I think it's 150, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Everything with a tongue is praise the Lord. Tongues are, we're going to praise the Lord forever. So he's not saying tongues as in we won't be able to speak one day. He's saying the gift of tongues. Look at this. He's saying uh, whether there be tongues, they shall see. That's the supernatural operation of speaking different languages that you did not learn. Like they did in Acts chapter two, verse number eight, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. When you get to Philippians, Paul says, I pray that your your love grows in knowledge. The knowledge here is the gift of knowledge. We're supernatural giving of knowledge. Let me see if it's over here. Pastors in those days didn't have to plan anything. Didn't have to make a sermon. Up. Go right up and, and start speaking. All God needed was a willing heart mm -hmm. because the Bible does say the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, see, that's another thing. You know this craziness out there? They think you overcome by the spirit. Mm -hmm. The spirit never did that to anybody. No. You had to be a willing participant. If, if, I, if God had a word for, if, I, if God gave me a word for you guys and I decided I wasn't going to communicate it, that was my choice. He picked somebody else and he punished me, but that was my choice. You ever heard of somebody named Jonah? Yeah. God told Jonah, here's the message I want you to give to those Ninevites. I'm not saying nothing, Lord. All right, well, you just die and you do some other stuff. Well, when you get tired of all these problems, then you can. Listen, I'm going to show you all something. Go, over, go back to chapter 12. Like Ryan said, the, the preachers didn't have to put together a sermon. All they had to do was have a willing heart and get up in that pulpit and go. Look at this. Verse number. Um, verse eight. First uh, Corinthians 12, verse eight. For to one is given by the spirit, the word of wisdom to another, the word of what knowledge, knowledge by the same spirit. That's what he's talking about. Go back to chapter uh, 13, verse eight. At the end, where there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. He's talking about that gift. God wants us to know, have knowledge, but it's from studying the word today. Keep reading. Verse 8. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, it shall vanish away. Verse 9. For we know how in part. And I was blessed by a brother, Brother Dwayne, the one I, we were just talking about, had the bronchitis, in part. And we prophesy in part. And he, he, you see this word which says, for we know in part, no. Know. That's gnosis. I'm going to mess it up. G N O S. Okay. But then there's a word knowledge later that's epi, epi gnosis. Epic, right? One is knowledge, but it's not the full knowledge. That's that. We know in part. One is epi knowledge, full knowledge. That's what we get once the revelation of the mystery is complete. Yes. Verse number 10, but when that which is perfect is come. I don't know why people say that this is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's crazy. He's not a that. It would be when he who is, I mean, he's a person. He's a man. The man, Christ Jesus, our Lord. When that which is perfect. He's talking about, he's talking in the, in the context, you can see he's talking about knowledge, wisdom, the word. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be what? Done away. And what we're going to see is that the word of God, the revelation of the mystery being complete is what's going to cut all of that off. OK, it's when the revelation of the mystery was complete and that was completed before the death of the Apostle Paul. Go over to chapter 14. I, I mentioned this verse just for those who, who look at verse 31 and 32. 31 through 33. 1 Corinthians 14, 31. For ye may all prophesy one by one. So by the way, even when it was in operation, it was order, decent and in order, right? The, the chapter ends. That all may learn, verse 31, and all may be comforted. Now, verse 32, I want everybody to see this. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the what? That means it's not this crazy where the spirit overtook them. It was the spirit using him and said, you willing to give this command? Yes, dear Lord, speak through me. It wasn't something he just took over their life. Craziness that you see out there. 
And Paul lays out all that out in this chapter. But I just want you to see 1 Corinthians is during is the early epistle during the transition. 2 Corinthians, we already saw that. I won't even go. Well, yeah, let's look at another one. Go to chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Remember, I was talking about those angels and manifestations and stuff. Um, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, we started off the passage in 2 Corinthians 12. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So he was still getting revelation. But Satan was also doing things, manifesting himself and his and his uh, his his minions. Uh, look at Second Corinthians, chapter 11. Verse 13. For such are false apostles. These guys who were fooling the Corinthians. Deceitful workers. By the way, it's interesting, deceitful workers. Paul uses the term evil workers to describe members of the body of Christ who do these things. Here he just used deceitful workers. These would be Jews who either live or they outside of the body of Christ. Because even the guys in the little flock, they would come in false brethren, unawares and so forth. pretending They were pretending to be members of the body, but they weren't. By the way, how could a Jew get away with that early in, 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 in the, the body of Christ? Because most of the body of Christ was Jews who got saved. In the infancy of the church, Paul began the body of Christ in synagogues. I mean, excuse me, you go and preach synagogues, then leave, leave the synagogue, start a church. Point is, look at this. Deceitful workers, verse 13, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Verse 14, and no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as men. Listen, Satan was giving these men supernatural power. Satan has power. And he counterfeited the power of the Holy Ghost. You remember when the Lord would do miracles and those, those Pharisees say, ah, he does it by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And they blasphemed the Holy Ghost because they attributed to Satan the work of the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Satan has powers too. Second Thessalonians, we saw that when the Antichrist shows up, he gets his powers after the working of who? Satan. That's why even supernatural phenomenon, you can't say, oh, that's of God, because you don't know. And Satan will do stuff to confuse people, to get them away from the word. <coughs> to deceive them, that's right. That's why he calls them deceitful workers. You see that? Right. And then we know from chapter 12, he will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. All right, that's, uh, we did Galatians 1, Thessalonians 2, Thessalonians 1, Corinthians 2, Corinthians. Let's look at Romans. This is interesting about Romans. Go to Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. <coughs> And look at verse 10 and 11. And even in the book of Romans, Paul, even though he's, he, it's the one, two, three, four, five, six book, he's just on the cusp of getting the fullness of the revelation of the mystery. He is. Can I see that again, Jody? All right, they got Romans that are written about uh, AD 57. Oh, this makes sense. If Romans is written around... 57 AD, three is the number of completion. It, it shoots about right. They got 60 to 61 here. So that'd be about right, 57 to about 60. And now you got the book of Ephesians because the revelation of mystery is now completed in these books. I'll show you that in a moment. Look with me. I'll keep this right here, okay, Dodie? If you need it, let me know. Look at Romans chapter one, verse nine. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit. By the way, that's why our spirit is where we serve God. You, know, you remember in 1 Corinthians 5 where he says, for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He didn't say his soul would be saved because the guy's soul is saved. We're, 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 the judgment seat of Christ is to deal with our spiritual service. Verse 9, for God is my witness, whom I serve, what? With my spirit. Paul says in Philippians 3, we worship God in our spirits. Our service is a spiritual service. Notice, for God is my witness whom I serve with my... Can I tell you something? 
That's why your soul and your body can be weak today. We have brethren who are in wheelchairs, our brother Glenn, Leonard, others, whose bodies are broken down and so forth. But souls can be too. Pain and stuff like that. Where God operates initially is your spirit. He wants to strengthen your spirit because that's the thing that's going to go and be looked at at the judgment seat of Christ. Our service is a spiritual service. Even the Lord says to the woman at the well, he says, God wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth. Right. John four. Notice what Paul says here. Verse nine. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers. Verse 10. Making request. Remember, Paul says, when you pray to God, prayer, making requests with prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Verse 10, making request if by any means. You know what? As I, every time I read this, and I've read it hundreds of times, my heart just goes, Paul, if you tell God by any means, you've given him a lot of leeway <laughs> to do things. Because you know how Paul got to Rome? On a, on, a, on a slave ship, like on a prison ship. It wasn't fun. Read the book of Acts, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm going to be more specific. Dear Lord, do it this way. No, I'm just playing. But you know what? He's, he, see, because the Apostle Paul, he didn't care. He's like, Lord, whatever you want, any means. Notice, make a request. If by any means now, at length, I might have a prosperous journey. Notice, by the will of God to come unto you. By the way, he got there. Verse 11. For I long to see you. Why? That I may impart unto you some spiritual. Now, notice he didn't say spiritual gifts. He did, he's talking to the Romans. A spiritual gift. Something given to you for spiritual benefit and profit. What would that be? It's right there in the verse. To the end ye may be what? Established. Yes, he wants to establish them. Now, what is establishment? That's more from the outside in. It's the process of sanctification. But in Romans 16, he says, now to him that is a power to what? Establish you. That's the end result, what God does on the inside. One is the process, one is the end result, right? Mm -hmm. Verse number 12, that is that I may be comforted together with you. How? By the mutual faith, both of you and of me. Notice Paul wants to strengthen their faith. Now, how would he do that? Go to chapter 15. Go over to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. And look with me, if you will, down to verse number 28. Let's look at verse 28. When therefore I have performed, oh yeah, you know what he's doing now? He's going to take, he's going to take money to the poor saints at Jerusalem. Why would he have to do that? Money the money ran out from Acts chapter one through whatever, and then the gospels, because the Lord told them to sell all that they have. And when the God changed the program to the dispensation of grace, their money ran out. So God in his wisdom says, don't worry, y'all, y'all obeyed me. I changed it. The Gentiles are now going to give you spiritual they're going to um, give you uh, verse 26, for it that pleased them. Look at verse 26. For it pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia, territory of Corinth, to make a certain contribution to the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. Verse 27. It hath pleased them verily, truly, and their debtors they are. <coughs> for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their, who is that? The Jews, right? The, the believing Jews, spiritual things. Their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things, things that pertain to uh, the, the, the upkeep of, of, of the physical body, finances and stuff. Verse 28, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed unto them this fruit, every time you give to what God is doing in the grace message, it's fruit in the eyes of God, fruit that abounds to your account. Look at this, it's fruit. By the way, that tells you giving comes from within. It's something that's organically produced 
by the spirit and word of God in somebody. Fruit. I will come by you into Spain. Verse 29, I want you guys to see. And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the, what's that, what's that word? The what? Fullness. That's what I want you to see. The fullness. The fullness of what? Watch this. The fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Here's what Paul is saying. By the time I get to Rome, I'm going to have the revelation of the mystery in its fullness. Colossians, he says that. Colossians 1. To fulfill the word of God, even the mystery. Now, the fullness. That means when he wrote Romans, he didn't have it. One more passage in, in chapter 16. Look with me, if you will. Verse 19. Oh, you know what for context, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine. That's the doctrine of grace. Paul's doctrine. Which ye have learned and do what? Avoid them. Don't listen to their doctrine. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. You mean to tell me there could be people in the body of Christ that don't serve the Lord? Yes. Who are they serving? Their own belly. Their God is their belly. Philippians 3. And by what? Good words and fair speeches. They sound really good up there. Very articulate. But guess what? They deceive the hearts of the simple. Verse 19, for your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet, oh, I must say this in this Internet age. Watch what Paul says here. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. You know what Paul is saying? I'm going to tell you because I see it all the time. I get saints to write me all the time and they all worried about something. They don't watch something on the Internet, watch some video or something like that this, that, and the other. And they done got all stressed out about all this stuff out there. And now they're paranoid about everything. Because they put their minds on all that stuff. Paul says, put your mind on the word of God. We know all that stuff exists. Them that are without God judges, Paul said. Notice what he says here. I want you to be wise concerning that which is good. The word. And simple. Be a simpleton with all that evil stuff. Don't put all that evil. I'm telling you all this. I hear it from saints all the time. Brother Ron, this is going on. Brother Ron, this. I said, I know. Stop watching that stuff. I was going to say a, a C word. That, stop watching. Because Paul says that which is wise, which is good, the word, and simple concerning evil. He doesn't want all that stuff in your mind. This is important. Because with the internet, I hear from saints all the time. And now everything is a conspiracy theory. Going to, it, they're going crazy and they're paranoid and stuff. Worried about everything. Set your affection. Paul says, whatsoever things are true and lovely and pure and of good report. And just the, word, the things of the word of God. Don't, when, yes. That issue of simple concerning evil, God understands that Satan's going to put all this stuff out there, and if you're focused on all that stuff, it's going to drive you batty. Put it in the word of God. Notice what the next verse says. And verse 20, and, and look at verse 20. The reason he doesn't want you to focus on all that, look at verse 20. And the God of peace. When people write me this stuff, they want some peace. I say, listen, stop looking at all that crazy stuff. Look at this. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet when? Shortly, the grace of our Lord. Listen, this is Paul saying when God gives us the rest of the doctrine, Satan is no match for us. He alludes to the Genesis where he says, he shall bruise thy head. The seed of the woman shall bruise the seed of the serpent. That's what he's alluding to. And when you have the doctrine of the mystery, which is now complete. We have everything we need to have Satan. That's why when saints go, oh, boy, Satan been busy today. Oh, Satan. Been, well, he always going to be busy. But if you know the mystery, he's under your feet. That is a position of you. You, you have authority over him. How many times you got to bind Satan anyway? 
Satan, I bind you. And then you say, well, then when did he get out that bind? You got to bind them every day. Because it's crazy. Because look, they got their minds on all type of stuff that's not from the truth. Paul says, that which wise, that which is good, the word, rightly divided, and simple concerning evil. You know, Paul tells a pastor, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Doesn't mean I don't know what's going on. I know it means I'm not going to let, Krista said it, set your affection on things where? On things above. If your affection is on anything of this earth, about this earth, it's wrong. Set your affection on things above, not on things on earth, right? For our conversation is in heaven, from which also we look for the Savior. We're in this world so temporarily. If you let anything about this earth and this world affect you so much, it's, it's going to go, it's messing you up. So Paul says, once that mystery is complete, then we'll have Satan under our feet. So I just want I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to have to end, but I'm, I'm gonna, we're going to pick this up next week, next time. Let me, let me go to Ephesians. We're going to end in Ephesians here. Go to Ephesians chapter number one. So Ephesians, now the revelation of the mystery is complete. And we'll look at his latter epistles in the next session. Look at Ephesians chapter number one. And here's a verse that shows that it's done. We're going to look at Ephesians one and Ephesians three, and then we'll, we'll end. And we'll pick, up, we'll pick up those in the next se se session. I got a, nice, some nice verses about that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Uh, you know what? Start at verse 7 for the context. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption, how? Through his blood. Oh, I love this. The forgiveness of sins according to the what? Riches of his grace. You, you know, you know, one of my favorite verses in chapter two, when Paul says, verse four, but God, who is rich in what mercy? He's rich in grace. He's rich. in. He's a rich person who wants to give his riches away. I always think about this uh, Richard Pryor movie. He was a baseball player. It's called Bruce. I, maybe I'm mixing. Them up. It's called Brewster's Millions. And in order to get, I think, 300 million, he had to give away 30 million dollars in 30 days, but he couldn't tell anybody he was doing it. And his friends thought he was crazy because he got this $30 million and he was just kind of giving it away. And they kept saying, no, you got to save it. But he, in his mind, he's like, if I give it away and t nobody knows, I get $300 million. They think that was the plot. But it, it reminded me of Brewster's Million. He was trying to give this money away. And his friends thought, you nuts, keep your money. He couldn't tell them, but if I give it away, I get 10 times that. I think that was the plot. God is rich that way. He has all of this riches of grace and mercy. And he wants to give it free gift. But there's only one catch. Unlike Richard Pryor, who couldn't tell anybody what he was doing, God is saying, I'm trying to tell you, and I just want you to believe my son died for this, for my riches, for my mercy. Trust him. See, notice God wants to give it to us. Notice verse seven, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he, father, hath abounded toward us in all what? All wisdom and prudence. The, the, the sound application of that wisdom. Verse 9. Having made known unto us the what? The mystery of his will. According to the good pleasure which he has purposed in himself. And what's that? The next dispensation. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather. We saw that. It starts with the body. Together in one, all things in Christ, both which were where? In heaven and which are on earth, even in him. For time's sake, go over to chapter 3. I'm going to read down these verses and we'll end. Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to, to me, given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the what? The mystery. See, it's all about the mystery now. It's done. As I wrote a foreign few words, whereby when ye read, I love that. When you read, you got to read Paul. Ye may understand my knowledge. And Paul writes it like the way I put the puzzle together. You got to see it the way he does. My knowledge in the mystery of Christ. See? The mystery. Christ according to Revelation. Mystery. Which in, uh, verse 5, which in other ages was what? Not made known unto the sons of men. Now it's revealed. He got, everybody got verse 5? 
as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets, how? By the Spirit. Now, the revelation of mystery is complete. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Where up, verse 7. Oh, let me say this. Because of the Roman Empire, So Paul had other books to write. So he wrote, he wrote to the Philippian church, to Colossians, to Timothy, Titus, Philemon, okay? And these would be called, later we're going to see, these are the pastoral epistles, uh, how to take that doctrine and make it work amongst the saints and the local assembly. But now there was no more information that God had to give out. It was all going to be now about writing it down. Yes, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, is where God just now starts, he wrote down the doctrine. And then these epistles here show how to take all that doctrine and apply it in a local assembly, right? In your life in a local assembly. All right, let's finish verse 7 and now. Wherefore I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power unto me. Look at Paul, look at our apostle Paul's humility who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. Here's the definition of his grace. That I should preach among the who? The, un the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Why are they unsearchable? You, it, that wasn't written down in the Old Testament. That's right. Kept secret. Verse 9, and to make all men, as both Jew and Gentile, see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid where? In God. in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Now we know. Now that it's, it's finished, now the angelic hosts know. Verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers where? In heavenly places <laughs> might be known by the church the manifold, that multifaceted wisdom of God. The angels knew that Father God would reconcile all things to himself in the heavens and earth. They knew he could. He's the almighty. What they didn't know was how and when. The how is through the church, which is his body, us, for the heavenly places, chapter one. And the when is at the resurrection. When the dispensation, the fullness of time comes right after the dispensation of grace ends, we're going to go to that judgment seat of Christ. He's going to take us holy without blame before God and Father in love. And God's going to dole out our reward. Join heirs with Christ. We're going to reign on, with crowns on thrones, king of kings. And all of our brethren be lords in this fashion, lord of lords, because we're going to judge. Lord means righteous judges. We're going to prepare all of our brethren to be judge, judges at that great white throne judgment. Okay? Every member of the body of Christ will be out there, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 6. But the point is, now we know, now the heavens know, but it's through the revelation of mystery. So in this session, we looked at the early epistles, and then I'm, I'm excited because now that the revelation of mystery is complete, we're going to be looking at the latter epistles. And when we rightly divide Paul, you have to understand, when you're reading these six books, Galatians 1 and 2 Thessalonians 1 and Corinthians, Romans, it's not complete, so there's going to be some incomplete stuff there, stuff that he did early. So, and then when you get to these epistles, this is how the normal operation of the body of Christ is in these latter times, okay? And we'll see that next time. All right, let's pray. Oh, you know what? Let me get a gospel this day. Heavenly Father, uh, if there's anyone out there who hasn't trusted your son, the Lord Jesus, as their Savior, I always remember there could be someone watching this for the first time, may not know for sure. May they see the love that he has for them, the love you have for them that you gave your son. You delivered him up for us all, Father. So may they trust your son and his shed blood on Calvary's cross for their sins. And Father, if there's uh, saints who are listening, members of the body, and, 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 and don't study the word understanding that they must rightly divide, even the Apostle Paul. And the first thing is his early epistles versus latter. Uh, the next few sessions we'll see um, position versus practice 
and, and, and other ways they have to, uh, corporate versus individual, that it will make their study of your holy word more profitable, which in turn will prepare them, their spirit, for the judgment seat of Christ. That's my prayer for these saints. May you give me and these saints the ability to minister these things clearly to the saints so that we all will be holy and without blame before you in love. Thank you for the privilege and honor of, of studying your holy word with others tonight, Father. We ask you bless this, this, uh, this word that you've given us in our hearts and that we might believe it by faith and that let it work effectually in us as we believe it. We thank you for this time and all this in Christ's name. Amen.